Okay, so we're back to looking at these representation vectors. So I know this topic is sort of, or this section, I should say, I should probably look at the order of these sections. It's kind of weird the way the textbook does it. We talk about these for a bit, and then we talk about dimension and some other stuff, and then it's back to these. And it's like, well, what was that for? Why is this being presented in this order? So this has no immediate relation to what we've been talking about in the last few days, but still good stuff. So let's make the observation that the same vector can be stored in multiple ways. So we think of storing a vector using a basis. Like if we have a vector x and a basis b, we can store that vector using that basis. We have a vector x and a basis c. We can store the vector using that basis. So let's ask a question. If we know how a vector is being rep is represented with respect to one basis. And then we have another basis that we're interested in. Can we represent the vector in terms of that second basis? And we're going to try to do this without finding x. And the reason we're going to try to do this without finding x is that, remember, x is just a vector in some arbitrary vector space. It could be very difficult to work with. So we don't want to work with x. That's kind of the whole point. We want to work with nice column vectors that we can perform a row reduction on and that sort of thing. And the answer to that question is yes. I would not have asked it otherwise. Let's say we have a basis B, and for now, let's just leave this abstract. We've got a dimension two vector space that has a basis with two vectors in it. And then we have a second basis with two different vectors in it. And say that we know how x is represented in terms of the first vector space 
and we want to know how x is represented in terms of the ve second vector space. Well, we're not going to write down what x is. That was kind of the, um, that's, let's give a concrete vector here. I say that we know this representation vector. So let's say that it's three, one. And we know then that x is three times b1 plus 1 times b2. Probably don't actually need all that space I left myself, but x is that. And therefore, the representation vector of x with respect to c is the representation vector of that sum with respect to c. And now we're going to use the fact that representation is a linear process. So the representation vector of a sum is the sum of the representation vectors. And we can pull scalars out, again, because representation is linear. And you can pull scalars out of linear functions. And we get 3 times the representation of B1 with respect to C plus 1 times the representation of B2 with respect to C. And, okay, we're so close to not having to go onto a separate page. Let's get rid of that. Let's cordon the northwest part of the board off. I suppose actually the uh, southeast, whatever, uh, the upper left portion of the board will cordon off. And uh, this is a linear combination of vectors. And a linear combination of vectors is a matrix times a vector. In particular, this is the matrix that has as its columns the representation of B1 and the representation of B2. And it's being multiplied, well, it's being multiplied by 3, 1. And 3, 1 is the representation of x with respect to b. So, we might or might not be able to do this easily. 
but if we can represent the basis B in terms of this new basis C, then we can represent any vector in terms of the new basis C. It's just a matter of taking the old representation and multiplying it by a matrix. And this matrix has sort of weird notation. Um, well, weird from the point of view of your calculus professor, because I'm so used to all of my arrows going from the left to the right. And here, there's an arrow from the right to the left. But you see the sort of import of the notation. We knew the representation of x in terms of b. So we start there. And we want the representation of x in terms of c, so we end up there. And we just have an arrow going from where we start to where we end up. For whatever reason, the arrow is pointing from left to right. And this thing has a name. It's called the change of coordinates matrix. So let's look at a more concrete example. And let's sort of ask ourselves how this works out in practice. Say that beta equals, yeah, before we ask before we look at a more concrete example, let's talk more about doing this kind of in practice. Beta is B1, B2, or just B, I suppose. A script B is B1, B2, script C, C1, C2. And say that our goal is to solve, or rather to find, this change of coordinate matrix. And let's suppose, let's suppose we're in our end. And the reason that we're going to assume we're in Rn is that in order to find this change of coordinate matrix, we need to solve two vector equations. We need to know how B1 is expressed in terms of C. The solution to this will give us the first column that we need. And we need to know how B2 is expressed in terms of C. And the answer to that will give us the second column that we need. Um, and we can certainly ask this 
question in any vector space, but the only vector space where we know how to answer this is Rn. If we're in R2 here, we can solve these vector equations using Gauss-Jordan elimination. If we were in the vector space of, well, the vector space of continuous functions wouldn't have a basis of two vectors. But if we did have something like that, we wouldn't have any method of solving those equations, so we'd sort of be stuck. So at least for now, let's assume we're in here. Down the line, we'll learn to use isomorphisms to do this for other vector spaces too. Um, how do we solve these equations with Gauss-Jordan elimination on this matrix and Gauss-Jordan elimination? on that matrix. And it's perfectly okay to just do that, to go into your calculator, perform two acts of Gauss-Jordan elimination, but sort of similar to when we were working with matrix inverses, we can do this as a single act of elimination on an augmented matrix. Because if we do this twice, I mean, almost every step we do is going to be wasted. Like, if our first step over here is to divide the first row by five, our first step over here is also going to be to divide the first row by five. And these first rows are almost identical. They're only different in the last column. So we're doing a lot of the same division twice. We can get around that by instead performing Gauss-Jordan elimination on kind of this super augmented matrix where we have all the basis vectors of C on the left and we have all the basis vectors of B on the right. And now that I'm thinking about it, this might very well be the reason for that notation. So that the basis that's on the left here is also on the left down here. So we can do an example, let me get our calculator warmed up. Okay, online students can't see it, but we have our calculator and we are good to go. So, example, let's say B,
is a fact and C is this. And we want the change of coordinate matrix from one of these vector or one of these bases to the other. So say from C to B. Then according to what's come before, this will be a quick act of Gauss-Jordan elimination, or at least it will be quick if I can avoid making any entry errors. So the, vec the vectors in C go on the left, so that's one, negative four, and three, negative five, and the vectors in B go on the right, so that's negative nine, one, negative five, negative one. Now we're just gonna hit this with RREF, Gauss-Jordan elimination, to put it in reduced row echelon form. And just like, what's going on? Just like uh, when you're finding an inverse, you see we have this identity over on the left. And this 6, 4, negative 5, negative 3 over on the right. And we can find the other if we want to go the other direction. If we want to go from, from, no, I'm writing, if we want to go from B to C, it's going to just be the same process, except that our, um, our vectors, the C's are going to be written first and the B's are going to be written second. So when we go to enter these, it's um, going to be negative nine, one, negative five, negative one. You see the vectors that were on the right are going to come over to the left. And now the vectors that were on the left are going to come over to the right. We can once again perform Gauss-Jordan elimination and get um, get our matrix, which is a little uglier this time. Negative one point five, negative two, two point five, three.
Assuming that I didn't do anything uh, wrong, which I don't think I did, but we'll know soon enough, these two change of coordinate matrices ought to be inverses of each other. And that, as I say, is easy enough to check. I'm just going to do this quickly. 6, 4, negative 5, negative 3. Six, four, was it? Nope. Negative five. Negative three. So let's find C and let's take its inverse. And we didn't do anything wrong. You see this matrix here is what we got from reduced row echelon, from Gauss-Jordan elimination. I've mentioned this before, finding inverses is a bad idea. It's numerically unstable. I mean, that's very, these like little two by two toy problems. Matters of numeric stability are unlikely to sort of show up but in kind of real world settings, you would not use this inverse. If you wanted both these matrices, you'd find both these matrices using Gauss-Jordan elimination twice. So exactly what I said, but there is this relationship between the change of coordinate matrices and 